Let's talk about hope, shall we? Who needs hope this morning? Do you need hope? Our Christmas season is that season of hope. Amen? When we were lighting our, our candles, we're, we're lighting the light in this world. It shines. This is what is symbolized with the, with the wreath and with the candles. It's shining those lights in darkness. We need this hope. Um, our government needs hope, right? We all need hope right now. So I have been preaching about um, hope uh, leading up to Christmas. The first one I talked about hope against hope. I just drew that example from Abraham and how he had to, he was in this life situation where he was old already and he had to have, have hope against hope. Hope when there is just like actually no chance anymore to even have hope and he had that hope. And then the second one uh, we preached about turning hearts to God, turning hearts to God. Um, and in turning hearts to God, do you remember what I talked about there? Yes, about doubt. Um, what are two hindrances that we can have uh, when it comes to ministering to God? I compared this with John the Baptist. Remember that, where John the Baptist is ministering? And this is kind of like our ministry too, right? I want you to take just really briefly a moment and turn to your neighbor and ask him, how can we a blessing to our neighbors or to a school friend or, I don't know, something? How can we be a blessing? <clears throat> Anybody say anything? Let me hear something. How can you be a blessing? Say to, li oh, to listen, that's a good one, to listen, yeah. Anybody else have something else? To pray, yes. Anyone else? To encourage, very good. Huh? Invite him to church, yes. Anything else? Yes, absolutely, good job. Yeah. But do you believe that God wants us to be a blessing to our family, to our friends, to our church family, to everybody that we meet at the workplace? Wow, some of those are hard, but the Lord wants us to be a blessing. And so much of our work is kind of like the work of John the Baptist. It's just preparing, preparing hearts for the Lord, turning hearts to God so that they're able to receive from God. A lot of that work is very similar. What I want to talk about today is the, in the third one, and I call this in, in a special way, and you will hear it uh, in a verse. It's called the throne of David. The throne of David. So when we are talking about hope, that we need to have hope, we, sometimes we have the situation of we need to have hope even when there is little chance of God just being able to come through, but God can do it and hanging on to this hope. In the meantime, strengthening ourselves as we give glory to God. And then the other thing is turning hearts to God. You know, we, sometimes we deal with doubt, right? Everybody's dealing with doubt. We deal with doubt. Sometimes we deal with rejection. We do. But in, nonetheless, we're still in that ministry and ministering to the Lord. Now, there is something else. Now, as we move forward in our story, and again, our story is from Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and, and open to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> and there, we're moving closer to the story, to the birth narrative here. And this is now the announcement when uh, Jesus is going to be born. Uh, last week, we talked about John the Baptist um, with Zechariah, um, how he's going to have a son that was John the Baptist. And now uh, it's being foretold that Jesus is going to be born to Joseph and Mary. And there is something in this story that I really, um, I, I really feel like it's, it, it really speaks to us because we all live in a democracy, right? Who has a throne, right? The president doesn't have a throne. Nobody has a throne. It's like such a foreign language to talk about a kingdom, to talk about this monarchy where one, one guy is in charge, one person is in charge, and he has this hierarchy, and he's just, uh, he has this army and everything, but it, it's so different. We have a democracy, like let, let's have a majority vote, uh, who is all for it and who is all against it, and if the majority decides it must be. No, there's one individual that is in charge, and that is God. 
and that is God. And it's like in our personal lives, he, there is no democracy. You realize that sometimes we argue and we're bigger with God, and we're like, no, I don't want that. And you know, it's, it's not supposed to be this way. But it's like, no, it is a, a rulership. There is God in our hearts, and He wants to sit on that throne of our lives. So let's dive into it. Um, in Luke chapter 1, um, in verse 26 onward, this, this is the whole story. And um, before I really want to get into a, a couple uh, items here, I just want to skip uh, read the story here. So it, it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, does that ring a name? The same angel that appeared to Zechariah in the temple at the right uh, hand of the uh, altar of incense there, and he appeared and was like, dude, God would not send me. I'm Gabriel, right? God would not, I'm standing in the presence of God and God has sent me. I would not be there if it would not be a very serious thing. And so take that message is and have faith. It's that same Gabriel now comes uh, to Mary. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came and said to her, Greetings, O your favorite one. The Lord is with you. But, he was, but she was greatly troubled. I mean, just kind of same response like Zechariah. She was greatly troubled. And she was wondering what sort of greeting this might be. Like, that's an odd greeting, right? There's an angel appearing before you. And it's like, hey, your favorite one. Like, what? Really? That's nice that somebody says that. Nobody ever told me that. And then in verse 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you should call him named Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There shall be no end. And then and Mary said to the angel, how will this be? Uh, this word, how will this be, or the, the, this phrase is actually the same phrase that Zechariah used in verse 18, where he also said, how shall I know this? But then he added like doubts to it, like I am old, my, my wife is advanced in years. But she, Mary, actually ended by saying in verse 38, uh, and Mary said, Behold, I am, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Um, and then later on in 45, we read, um, and this is like when, when Elizabeth now is coming to Mary, and the baby leaped in her belly already. And in verse 45, it says, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. I was like, I, that's what we talked about in the youth. Um, there is promise and fulfillment. And what we, when the Lord tells us early on, in order to trigger our faith, we need to believe, we need to have this faith that the Lord will also fulfill it. And then in verse 48, um, uh, this whole servant song is, is just really a uh, Mary song. The, it's just a really beautiful. You, you should read that. I'm not going to go into it all the way here. But what I want us to focus right now is when it comes, like it, it's this strange concept when God talks about the throne of David, that he's going to give this son the throne of David, and that's supposed to speak to Mary's life, but not only to Mary's life, but to Joseph's life and to everybody else in Israel. And that should speak to us too when God says, I'm going to put Jesus on the throne of David. He's going to have the throne of David. But first of all, I, I want to highlight a couple things. The first thing that I want to highlight is that God is with us. In this season of hope, one of the biggest things that we can hang on to is that God is with us. When we talk about this monarchy, that God's, God is ruling, that God is king over our life, one of the things we have to realize is that no matter what, no matter what circumstance, no matter what happened in your life, maybe in past, maybe really early past, and you can hardly remember what happened, but God is with us. And this is from this uh, greeting that the, that the Lord gives her. This is, this is Gabriel, right? He who stands in the presence of the Lord, who is the messenger of God. And God, when God sends his most trusted angel in order to, to bring a message. This Gabriel stands in front of Mary and he's telling her, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. I mean, here is, here is a, a, a young a virgin girl, it says, 
she's young. She was um, maybe in the age of 14 back then and knew, knew of not a whole lot of life and she knew that she was already betrothed, she was engaged to her husband and at, at, at one point there's going to be a, 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 a marriage and everything. So she was young, she was, she was innocent, she was young and here the Lord says to her, God is with you, that God is with you. Do you believe that God is with you in all your circumstances? You know, sometimes when you wonder, <laughs> you know, it's, it's maybe easy to believe that, yes, I, I believe God is with me. But then when Mary was on that long journey to Jerusalem, riding that donkey, you know, like, Joseph, I can't hold it anymore. We need to reach this. It's like, it's all your fault. Why, why are you dragging us to Bethlehem? You know, it's like there's some moments in her life where I bet, I guarantee you, she did not really feel like, that God is with her and where she wanders is like we cannot even find a room anywhere right uh, there's like really like sh should not this savior of the world be born in a palace or somewhere and it's like we're knocking at every door and everybody's turning us down it's like where is God right now you know I, sometimes I feel like very often in our life we come to a similar place where we wonder does God see us is God aware of what just happened why would God allow such and such to happen? And we start questioning. We can have those doubts. But the, the key is that God sees us. And he, for no reason, God has, uh, th there's a good reason that God has called this son, the coming Messiah, Emmanuel. Um, I, I want to take you back to Isaiah chapter 7, uh, where the name Emmanuel pops up here for the first time. And this is, again, it's the story of King Ahaz where the Syrian army invades. And God says, you should not make alliance with anybody else. Don't trust in anything else. Listen, I give you a sign, a sign that you're going to be victorious and that you don't have to rely on anything else or on anybody else. And that sign will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us no, no matter what. It, it sounds good sometimes, but it's just really hard to believe, right, that God is with us. And we, very often we kind of have to walk through the circumstance because later on in retrospect, when we look back, we'll be able to say that God was with us all along. But in that very moment, it's somewhat hard to, to focus and to keep our eyes on the Lord. In, the, in chapter 8 in Isaiah here too, verse 8 it talks about, O Emmanuel, listen to this, verse 9, be broken your people and, and scattered, give ear all of your countries, uh, strap on your army and be shattered, strap on your armor and be shattered, take counsel together if you want, but it will come to nothing. Oh man, when I think about uh, what's going on right now in our, in our uh, government, it's like, oh man, this is a good message. God is still in charge. They, con they take counsel together if you want, but it will come to nothing. Uh, speak a word and it will not stand for God is with us for god is with us no matter what what people when pe people stick their heads together and they come up with a plan king david struggled with this very often when he said that people around him tried to ensnare him they tried to make him fall whenever there's a monarchy somebody else wants the throne <laughs> it's just how it is with kings right and so they wanted to get him off the throne and uh, and he spoke this so many times but i trust in the lord and may those evil plans that people are harboring against me may they come to nothing may they all dissolve may they just all fall apart but i i i cling to the lord david used to rush in into the temple and into that uh, into the uh, th those that sacrifice uh, altar, in th th they had four horns, and temple. Um, and, and David used to run into this temple when he had this despair, when he felt persecuted, when he did not know what to do with his life anymore. He ran into the temple. He ran straight in, and he said he hang on to the horns of this altar. This is the altar where sacrifices are given. When you give like for redemption, when you give uh, for, for forgiveness of sin, where you bring your sacrifice, and here's David. Just imagine who runs to that altar. He kneels down. He hangs on that horn like, Lord, Lord, don't let go of me. Don't let go of me. 
that's this picture of, 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 of a guy who knows that he wants God in his life. This is a, a message that we need to have that God sees every moment of our life. When you sit at the workplace and something happens, God is there and God sees. Do you believe that? God sees. There is nothing that happened in your past that you can blame on your present circumstance because God was there and God is with you right now too. And God has a future for you that is not determined on your past. It is determined on God's presence, on Emmanuel, on God with you. That's all that counts. That's all that counts. God is, is with us. That's something that sticks out in the story. The second thing that sticks out in the story is the name that is given to this child. Flip back to, to Luke chapter 1. There is the name here. Now, it's not only called Emmanuel, but his name is Jesus. And this is in, in verse 31. Chapter 1, 31. It says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Do you know what Jesus means? Yeshua basically means uh, God saves. And you should call his name. I'm going to give you a child, and his name shall be I save. His name shall be God saves. God saves. God saves. Israel, at this time, they, 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 they needed that Savior. They were under Roman rule, and they were anticipating for 400 years, uh, like, where is this Messiah going to come from? When, when it, there was 400 years of silence, that's a long time. That's transgenerational already. It's like generation after generation, all of a sudden, the kids and the kids' is kids and kids' is kids, all they hear is from, like, yeah, my mom used to tell me that grandpa used to say this and that. And it's, it's such far distance already. It's like people would give up hope normally, right? But there's, there's still this hope within Israel that the Savior will come. And all of a sudden, to a virgin girl, the Lord of hosts says, you will bear a son, and he will be that savior, that savior that redeems Israel. And that name, God saves, is so powerful. In Philippians chapter 2, you know, this name Jesus that was given is such a sweet name. By this name Jesus, demons have to flee. Darkness has to flee. When God gives his son to this world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave that only begotten son, and he gave that name Jesus, that authority, that when, when, when we are in despair, that when we are lonely, all you have to do is to remember that one name Jesus. It's one of the things that we're teaching our kids too. No matter what circumstances, just keep that name Jesus really close on your lips. Keep it close to your mind. Keep it close to your heart. Never forget that name. And when you need that name, just call on him. When there is a car accident happen, don't forget that name, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And there is authority. There is power in this name. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, I start, I'll just start in verse 6. Who, though he was... In the form of God did not count equally with God a, things to be, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. I want you to remember the word humble. There is something about humbleness uh, that e even in, in the story of Mary here, it comes out so clearly. Anything that God can do and wants to do, he does with humble hearts. He does with humble hearts. He has, God has this, this, this strange um, personality trait that whenever he encounters pride in people, he resists it. But whenever there is a humble heart and a humble spirit, God elevates that. God lifts it. He humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, the name, the name Jesus. That name that was given to him, you should call his name Jesus. He has given to him the name that is above all names. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And when it says every knee shall bow, 
then it means every knee. Like there, there is no attack from the enemy. There is nothing that the enemy can throw your way in your lifetime that the name of Jesus uh, cannot overcome. Amen? That at this name, when you name this name, at this name of Jesus, every knee must bow. I you know we live in the in the world and in the age where uh, just the movie industry is just telling you, you know, there's secret spells. You know, if don't, don't ever get into witchcraft, by the way. But like, if you have, if you know secret formulas, if you know a secret spell or something that that helps, or maybe secret powers, there's so many. There is only one name, and it's not secret. And it has been revealed to the world that has all the power in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, by which every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's like taking a knee and saying, "No, Jesus." Christ is Lord. This, that's, that's that powerful name. And this is all in this story, in this hope story of our, of our narrative. And then there's a third point when it comes to this royal throne of David that I, I really want you to see too. And that's uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 32. And that's that, that kingship. And it says, and he will be great. And he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He, Jesus was from the lineage of David. And God gave, um, you can read all of this, I believe it's in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, you have this whole story uh, of, of when, when David became king and God gave him this, pro this promise about the Davidic covenant, it was called, that there will be an everlasting, that from his lineage, and uh, just uh, preach about this and, uh, to the youth on, on Wednesday, that this whole thing with Saul, and when God was just looking at his heart and he had, he had to reject him as king, and he picked for himself a king that would whole follow after him, and it was a shepherd boy on the field somewhere, because God does not look on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart, on the heart only. Everything else God can add later on to it. And so he picks this king to be the king over Israel. And because he's faithful and because he's obedient, God promises him and he knows from that lineage will Jesus come and he, uh, he will send Jesus. And so he, he gives him this Davidic covenant and says, on your throne, your rule, your kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Do you, do you realize that right now we are, we are under the same rule? from still having the same rule from the Davidic covenant because it's Jesus Christ who still sits on the throne and he is our king? Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that odd somehow to think that way? And it's like, wow, so many thousands, 1,000 BC, uh, King David was given a promise of a future king that his lineage, there will be a king that sits forever on the throne and nobody and nothing can take this kingdom and this rulership away from him. And that is 3,000 years ago, later, now is our king. 3,000 years already. We have that promise and that fulfillment right now. And we are, in all of this, we are citizens of heaven. We have the one who sits on the throne and on the throne from his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, <laughs> and of his kingdom, there will be no end. There will be no end. This kingdom stands already. You know, the, the world's governments, they don't see that kingdom. They don't calculate with that kingdom. But that kingdom is real. That kingdom is as real as any other governmental institution in this world. There is a real kingdom, and you and I and all of us, we are citizens of that kingdom. Amen? Amen. We are citizens of this heavenly kingdom. Do you know that in, when we are citizens, when we belong to a kingdom, that this kingdom has its own culture? Right? When you go to India, they have their own culture. When you go to China, they have their own culture. Americans have their own culture. Kingdom culture has its own culture. There is a, a verse here in, in 74 and 75 where it says, and we uh, being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. One of the traits, one of the characteristics of us, the kingdom people, and being citizens of heaven is that we live without fear. There is no fear in somebody who has the most high God sitting on the throne. 
mighty to serve him. We are, we are serving God without fear. Fear is the one thing that keeps us from serving. Yes. Remember that. And then God cannot be pleased. We need to serve this God without fear. And then it says, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. We have our own kingdom culture. And our kingdom culture is that we cannot possibly be afraid if our king is the king of heavens and our lives are lived out the way that kingdom children behave or kingdom citizens behave is with holiness and righteousness holiness and righteousness and and there this is a lifelong process for all of us constantly working on that holiness lord what else is an obstacle to your presence in my life what else is detestable to you what else what are my closet loves that i need to clean out so that you have the kingship in my living room so that you have the kingship in all my life what what is there that is displeasing to you i want to give it all away i want to give it all up we have this this citizenship we have our own culture <laughs> I don't know if I, you have ever gotten that talk from me, but when I, when I talk about culture, I always say it's based on values, safeguarded by systems, and expressed by language. And that's what we have. We have our own values with God, and it's different from the values of this world. We have our own systems. One of our systems is coming to church on Sunday, amen? Prayer life. Playing worship and filling ourselves, strengthening ourselves with worship. That is all stuff that, that is the system that we have. And then we express it with language. If there is foul language coming out of a mouth, uh, you, if you ever hear somebody talk with a foul language, you should, you should tell them, it's like, man, you're not talking kingdom language here right now. It's true. Kingdom language does not sound like that. Kingdom language is holy. It is hopeful. It trusts. It is faithful. It does not envy. It does not hold any grudges or anything. It's different when we're part of this, of this kingdom. And uh, when you go back to this chapter in, in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, it talks about this kingdom and of this citizenship. And this is, um, for unto us a child is born is the header. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And it says, And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. Do you need a counselor? Do you need somebody who gives you an advice? There is the name that is above all names. His name is not only Wonderful, his name is a Counselor. Hallelujah, it can save a lot of bills. <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. There's, there's, I, I'm a counselor too. There's good counseling, but I hope it's godly counseling. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Listen, it talks about the increase of his government. We are spreading that kingdom of God, right? We, we are kingdom workers. We're spreading the kingdom of God. And that there is, it's spreading. It, it's going out from among us. Every time we're pulling somebody in into the kingdom of God, he's part of that new citizenship. He has a new passport. He has a new citizenship. Um, and what we're working on is the increase of the government and of peace. And of peace. We should have peace. The kingdom culture is a culture of peace. If you see that there is fear going on and there is everything else, unsettledness going on, the, when we are the children of God, the children of light, the children of the God most high, there is a peace that comes within. There should be increasing peace. There needs to be peace in the house. We should be spreading peace at our workplace. Amen? There shall be no end, it says, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Forevermore. And it talks about from this time forth and beyond 2020. That's literally what it says here in my Bible. <laughs> when it, it's included in forevermore. Just use the right hermeneutics. This rulership, this kingship of God 
is very special and it is still active. We, we, you know, we, we look so much toward the government, um, toward everything that we have in the government. We look toward other governments and everything that's going on. But we also have, we cannot lose focus in the midst of all that. We need, we, don't get me wrong, we need to pray for our government. The, it, our government needs it really dire right now. Um, but apart from that, we cannot lose perspective that we are part of a heavenly government, of a heavenly kingship. Yes. Honey, would you give me my passports here? I brought, as a sermon illustration, our passports. Those are our passports from our family. We have for some reason, seven. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's because our children have dual citizenship. And those uh, nice red ones, by the way, uh, those are European passports, okay? So those are our passports. And this passport, it says, Europäische Union, Republik Österreich, Reisepass. Yeah? I am an Austrian, and this is my citizenship. I have an Austrian citizenship. Actually, at the, at the U.S. consulate back in, in Europe, they said, never give this one up. This is an important one. You cannot give this one up. And as a chip, back then, there was a big discussion whether or not we were already taking the mark of the beast with this one. But anyway, I have a, a, I have a European citizenship. I am a, a citizen of Austria. This is your guys' uh, passport. It is a beautiful blue one, right, with the gold. This is Jana's passport. It is a U.S. passport. That, that means that she belongs, she is an, a U.S. citizen. The Apostle Paul talked that he's a Roman citizen. With that citizenship comes a couple of rights. Those are rights that you have. You have in the Constitution alienated right days. Nothing can undo the rights that you have. Amen? Nothing can do un undo the rights that I have with Austria. It's different. Um, here, my kids, they have a dual citizenship. Poor kids, they're really confused, right? <laughs> but they have a dual citizenship. And I, I show this because I want you to know one thing. When I did my uh, education in, in professional counseling, we had one class that I thought was going to be the most boring class. And it was about the legality, laws and everything. I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be a drag, right? And so I was going through the class, but this was the most interesting class. Because in this class, they taught me something about citizenship. In this class, it was actually said, when you're counseling, you know, you, you, there's a family, you're counseling with kids and everything, you need to know the legal status of our kids. Do you know that when we have children, we, ha we have the custodianship over our children? They belong to the government. The government can remove our custodianship over our children if we mess up with our children. If we're the government, if you have a passport, if you belong to the United States, then you have a citizenship with a government that is protecting your family and is protecting your children. And if there is anything that comes into harm, where kids come in harm's way, the government's responsibility is to step in and help an advocate for the children to help those children. They told us back then that when, when we moved to America, if, if so happens, if any tragic circumstances would ever happen, it is, <laughs> it is those two or three passports for our children where the Austrian government, even though like we would pass away, something would happen, our children are still here. The Austrian government would step in to help our children. You know, isn't that crazy? Because we are just the custodians over our children, but their citizenship, their citizenship talks about their protection and who is for them. Man, we are talking about a heavenly citizenship. We are talking about a heaven. If the earthly government can be so strict already and protect our children to protect us how much more would their heavenly government protect us as the children of god yes. man that is a concept just imagine that you have heavenly citizenship we have a heavenly citizenship no matter what circumstance can happen no matter what is said no matter what is done no matter what is experienced there is nothing that can ever happen where the heavenly father who has given us his citizenship would not step in because we are kingdom kids. We are kingdom children. We are citizens of the God most high. And he has at his disposal not just 
uh, what is it called, uh, child protection, but he has all the angels of the heavenly hosts available to dispatch on our behalf. That is what it talks about here with the throne of David and his government, there is no end. It talks about that this child that is born Jesus, he is our savior, and he sits on the throne of David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob and Riverside and McLeod County, and he will reign over us and his kingdom, our citizenship with him. There shall be no end. We have a citizenship in heaven. If we pass away, we're going to heaven because we have a citizenship not in this earth. They can dump our body wherever they want. Our citizenship is in heaven. And if we need our heavenly Father, if we need the Lord on our behalf to come through in a circumstance, he will dispatch angels and heavenly hosts on our behalf. And this is really what I, I want you to, to take away from the sermon today about when we look with hope and anticipation, there is the throne of David. There is a throne of David. And we have a heavenly citizenship. We are kingdom children and we have this heavenly citizenship. Man, this talks about protection. This talks about blessing. Amen? This talks about God. But it also means that you cannot step on your heavenly passport with your feet and like, ah, oh, I disregard it, I don't care about it. It is something that you have to be aware of. We have to know that we're citizens of heaven. We need to know what those rights are. When the enemy says we can, no, wait a second. <laughs> I have a heavenly passport that says I can. I have access to that stuff. Those finances are not coming or whatever. I have a heavenly citizenship and God is in charge. And I know that God can bring me through in this and he can unleash those funds that I need right now. And so my heavenly citizenship says I can. If, there is, if you somehow ended up in a circumstance where you have no access to something, your heavenly citizenship tells you that in the heavenly citizenship, you have access to it. Just pray it in. Allow the Lord to do a miracle on your behalf. And that is where the heavenly world penetrates our earthly world, where, we, where, this, where, this, where we start walking around like, Lord, I'm, I'm just a host for you. Come and work through me. Come and, and, and bless my circumstance. Do in my life and through my life whatever you want to do. We have a heavenly citizenship. That comes with rights. That comes with protection. And too often we don't think about it. And we're so discouraged by everything that we see in the news, everything that we maybe read on Facebook. We have to remember that our citizenship is in heaven. And in this Christmas story, when, when Jesus is born, we have this king that is born to us. He is our king. It's this name that is above every name. And we can name the name. And it's so beautiful when it talks about, it's this Emmanuel. It's like God, God is with us. He's with us. He's not a king on a distant throne somewhere, but he's with us 24-7 all the time in the presence of his Holy Spirit. You can pray to the Holy Spirit. You can say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Come lead me today. Show me my faults. Test my heart. My life is yours. Do with me as it pleases you. Amen? Amen. All right, I just want to close here. Yeah, let's uh, get up. Altar team, if you guys would come forward, we just want to offer prayer again. If you need prayer, if you need your heavenly citizenship to come through in one area of your life, don't go home right away. Just come and, and allow us to pray for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this truth that Jesus, you are a savior. You're not only carrying the name Savior, God saves. But you are also Emmanuel, you're God with us. You are with us 24-7 all the time. You have seen all circumstances. There is nothing that slips your attention. You watch over us and we have a heavenly citizenship and you sit on that throne. You rule our lives. And with this citizenship, Lord, we sometimes just forget it. Sometimes we're so distracted that we, don't, that we don't even think about it. But this morning, Father, we ask for you to wake us up. Wake us up and help us to see and to realize 
that we have passports from heaven with hosts of angels that you want to send on our behalf to help us. Lord, help us. Help us to see that truth and to live it and to apply it in our everyday life. Thank you for your presence here this morning. I bless everyone who has been watching. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you for Christmas Eve service.